All right, good morning, everybody. I think we are gonna go ahead and get started. This workshop is devising an advising toolkit for CE students. Our presenters today are Tammy Ward, Cheryl Goodyear DeGeorge, and Shonda Green. And um, if you would like any time during this session, if you would like to go ahead and put your questions into the Zoom group chat, then we'll take a look at them at the end of the um, session or towards the end of the session. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Cheryl Goodyear to George. And actually, I'm going to um, bring our presentation up and then I'm going to turn it right back over to um, Tammy Ward to get us started. So mm -hmm. I practice the technology, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can never be too careful, right? You just never know. Um, so <laughs> if you tuned in at 845, you already know my name is Tammy Ward and I'm the director of uh, concurrent enrollment at the Colorado Community College System Office. And I am here with Cheryl Goodyear DeGeorge, as Fred mentioned, from District 49, and Shonda Green from Pikes Peak Community College. The two of them work very closely and they're going to be doing the heavy lift on this presentation. Um, but I wanted to kind of kick things off from kind of the system perspective. So if you want to go to the next slide, Cheryl. Um, so the com community college system, um, this role is fairly new and is really trying to take a look at the macro view of concurrent enrollment for our 13 colleges. Of course, there's more than just us, but kind of looking at it from that perspective, perspective um, we had a task force that really looked at the goals and I'm just gonna review them quickly because a lot of you may have heard this before, but some of the things we looked at for the last couple of years is how do we increase the number of qualified teachers, um, HLC qualified in order to, um, to keep our accreditation. So we have to follow those guidelines. So how can we increase those numbers of teachers with their masters or 18 grad credit hours? How can we improve access to technology for students? Um, how can we increase matriculation of our students because they're taking that credit and we really want that credit to count. Um, we don't want them to um, waste credits. We don't want them to waste their cost dollars. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. We want them to complete something, um, whether it's with us or to a four-year. Um, it's all success, right? Um, we also are trying to look at the equity gap. So those are things that we're all thinking about even more so now in this virtual environment. So, I mean, also how to improve the enrollment process. And some of these things, especially those first couple of bullets have really been, it's really been helpful to the Department of Education based on House Bill 176 last year, um, had some money attached to wait, um, a grant that could help us do these kinds of things to help get more teachers those grad credits and maybe use some of that money toward better technology. So we've been making strides in these areas. We've been having a lot of events about matriculation. We've been having conversations, um, but we really, as we were going through as a task force and when I brought it out to the directors and the work group for concurrent enrollment, some, a piece that's a little bit lacking is advising. Um, so our current focus this year was really to say, okay, um, we have all these students enrolled. We're doing a great job of getting these big numbers of students to take college classes while in high school, which is great. But are we advising them enough and correctly? And so our current focus is to just really talk more about that. So my vision for this session when we started talking about this conference was let's talk about what we can give people, and I'll have you move to the next slide, Cheryl, um, to help um, increase our capacity. We are, oops, one back one. <laughs> We're all I went really, too far, sorry. I know, it's <laughs> really easy to do. We're all very, very busy and we're understaffed and maybe even more so now. Um, many schools are short on counseling staff. Many districts are facing budget cuts. Um, higher education is facing budget cuts. So it's extra, extra important now and even more so than before. How can we create some capacity to advise our students? Because we don't all have the bandwidth to sit one-on-one -on -one with students or talk to them <laughs> virtually at this point. So the idea was, could we create a toolkit? And when I started kind of looking through my files, I've been gathering documents and a lot of them have come from D49, Mary Perez has, has shared some documents we presented last year. And then I had some other documents from other areas, some national things, but I also was like, as I started talking to Mary about this, she said, well, we have this great partnership. My friend, Cheryl, who's about to talk, works very closely with Pikes Peak and Shonda um, and already have a lot of pieces in place. And they're gonna walk through what they do 
um, for concurrent enrollment students from kind of beginning to end right through it in to if, if they become an ascent student. So they have their own toolkit, so to speak, um, that has been very effective. And I think to share an example, I think is a great place to start. Um, obviously, your district may look different. Your um, higher ed partner might do things a little different. So your, your toolkit's going to be different. But it's gathering all those documents and information so you can kind of have them at, at your fingertips to say, OK, you need to know about this. Here it is. Um, we need to maybe assess readiness. Here's something you could use. So they have some great documents. Um, you may want to create something else. But I think the idea is let's just have this easy and at our fingertips so we can get students things when they need them right away. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back to Cheryl. And she and Shonda kind of, kind of go back and forth about her side on the secondary and then how Shonda supports her on the post-secondary side. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, and good morning. Um, Shonda, do you want to say hello so everybody can see your face pop up? Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Shonda. I am the advisor that helps assist with District 49. At our school, we break it up by district as we have several partners. Uh, so I work directly with D49. And I think one of the key things, and that's why we said getting started, um, partner early with your um, Institute of Higher Education, whatever that is. Um, some of you have more than one, um, but it has made all the difference in the world for us, I think, to streamline our process so that what we do complements what the college does, the information we need complements what the college needs. And so that's kind of how we're gonna talk about things today. Um, and so Shonda's gonna be popping in and talking about what things look like on her side and how that feeds into or complements what we're doing with our process. Um, the first thing we had to do was to understand our capacity, personnel, processes, all of those kinds of things. In um, about four years, we went from under 100 students to over 700 students. Um, and there's still only one of us, you know, <laughs> and typically at the schools, we have one advisor. Um, and so I think understanding that, you know, that you've got a lot of kids to deal with and how are you going to do that? Um, you know, beg, borrow and steal ideas as you can. Um, like I mentioned before, building your toolkit in conjunction um, with the college that you're working with. Um, Shonda, did you want to talk about that at all, about kind of that, you know, working in conjunction? Absolutely. One of the things we find that makes our partnership so successful is that we meet regularly, whether there's something that needs to be addressed, whether um, we just want to celebrate each other's successes or find uh, solutions to problems that have popped up. We're meeting on a regular basis so that we never feel like, oh, no, we need to meet with Cheryl. Something's going on. Instead. Um, it's something we're looking forward to and we're waiting to see uh, what, what's coming up next. So as we go through the different slides today, we'll be able to see some of the ways that we've partnered throughout the last couple of years and what we're planning for the future. Good, thank you. And I think the other thing is consistent and thorough training of all your advisors, um, particularly if you're a district like ours that has multiple high schools. Um, it's really important that all of the train the advisors get the same training. So if they're advising the same way, they're using the same tools and they're consistent. Um, and then try it out and don't be able to, don't be afraid to tweak it as you need to tweak it because you're gonna find things that you thought sounded like such a great idea and then they don't work quite well, very well. <laughs> um, ours was really developed over the past five or six years. It's certainly morphed over time. I think we get better every year. Um, and I think we have a common goal with um, Shonda's office and Pikes Peak Community College that our focus always is, how do we make this work the best for their students and the, our students and their families? Absolutely. And throughout this process, we're gonna see different ways that we've implemented um, processes to make sure that we're doing the best for them and we're doing no harm. We wanna make sure there's no harm done, so. So I think the first step one, the first and most important thing is really to help a student identify their pathway. Um, if they jump into the concurrent enrollment process and they don't have any idea what they wanna do in the future, it makes that advising piece very difficult because it's tough to help them choose their classes if they have no idea where they wanna end up. Um, we happen to use U Science and Tallow in our district. 
Um, other districts use Naviance, all kinds of different things, uh, just some kind of tool to help students identify their skills and their interests. Um, we also hold information nights and emails, social media. Um, you know, we just get the word out about concurrent enrollment. We share the differences with parents between college and high school. We talk about the advantages of concurrent enrollment, both on the high school side and on the earning college credit side. Um, and make sure that you don't forget those, those special populations, your special, ed in, um, if you can't talk, special education, um, your um, English language learners, and your free and reduced lunch populations. Um, we have links on all of those pages in our district and have made a really concerted effort to make sure that we reach out to those particular populations because when we got the information out, we got a flood. I mean, be ready for parents and students to show interest because when that spark is lit, the fire rages. Um, they came to us, but what we were finding is special ed, English language learners and free and reduced lunch, those students were not necessarily seeking us out. So we went to their to the departments that deal with that, those particular populations, trained them on the information and, and got all of that information out there. Something that we've really come to appreciate is the use of U Science with District 49 and seeing that um, the students, once they've come, they've finished high school, they've got their concurrent enrollment credits and we're helping advise them to be either ascent or moving forward. What we're finding is that the classes really align with the degree paths that they've been interested in. They're not taking classes just kind of willy nilly. It is actually doing them good and getting them towards the path that they'd like to go on. And that's directly related to the counselors knowing what the students are interested in and they have a, a good path with, uh, to move forward in. So that's very helpful. Great. This is just an example of one of the documents that we share early in the process, um, both as a reminder to students and to parents that college is different. Um, we have lots of different points in our process where we talk about this with parents. Um, they initial things and sign things that remind them that this is not high school, that this is college. Um, we are here, we love concurrent enrollment because we're here to help support your students through the process. We're not just throwing them into college and saying you're on your own, but we are expecting them to do things like self-advocate, to make sure that they understand about due dates and the way that things work at the college. And so this is one of the documents, like I said, we share early on as parents and students are trying to decide if concurrent enrollment is for them. Um, I think the other thing that we talk about when we're sharing all this at the beginning is making sure that they understand college is not that traditional thing that, that people think about. I have a lot of parents that say, you know, I don't know, my student wants to go into the trades. I don't really know if college is for them. And we talk a lot about all of the great programs that Pikes Peak Community College has and that, you know what, we're not just talking about academic credits. We're talking about skills for your students. They can get an associate's degree, they can get certificates. There are lots of things that they can do in their area of interest that will help them have a leg up in the job world. Um, you know, now we've identified a student's pathway and they say, yes, I think I'm ready to think about being involved in concurrent enrollment. Um, so we have right on our website, um, we share with students, there's also a half a page um, hard copy directions that we can give them that help them apply online to Pikes Peak Community, Community College. Um, we want them to obtain their S number. They need that so that they can, they know how to log in. They can sign up for the AccuPlacer or whatever test they're gonna take. Um, and then Pikes Peak Community College helps us tremendously. And Shawnee, talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So when the schools find it helpful, we're willing to send a staff member out to the to the high school, uh, sit down with like a computer lab full of students and walk them through the uh, application step by step. And if any of you have helped students do this in the past, you know that the application has changed greatly over the years. At one time, it was 
far more intense, a lot more information was needed. And so at those uh, points in time, we would definitely ask that they would collect the information ahead of time from their parents. We just have them fill out a form so that they had everything in one place. Um, we're so thankful the application has become much more streamlined and simple now, uh, but we do still need the students to have some specific information with them. So uh, the first thing is that they need their legal name and students are so quick to put in their nickname and what they go by. Uh, so while we're there helping them, we make sure they understand why we're using the legal name and uh, you know how to get that put in properly. Um, of course, their address, phone number, their date of birth, and then um, their social security number. So in the event that a student doesn't have a social security number uh, available to them at that moment, we can guide them on how to get through the application without it. Um, and in the situation where they simply just don't have one, there are steps within the application on how to bypass the uh, social security piece. And that has to do with choosing whether you're a US citizen versus a visa holder or an unknown type. Uh, so those things can help us get past that if we need to. Uh, but it's really important that it is entered when they do have one. Um, and I'll let Cheryl talk a little bit more about step three and we'll kind of circle back to that in just a minute. Well, and you cannot even carry through with the College Opportunity Fund, Shonda, because Absolutely. I know when they fill out the application, um, there's some options to choose there as well. Right, so on the Pikes Peak application, there's an option to choose to have us apply for the student with cough on their behalf. Um, and everyone really likes that option, but there are some pitfalls with that. So if the student does not enter a social security number, the application never goes through. It doesn't even make it to cough. So that's a situation where a student would need to complete a separate application. And so we're happy to help students walk through that. We guide uh, counselors in that as well. Um, and there's just a lot of reasons why um, you want to make sure that when the application is completed, it's done correctly and cough is just a big piece of that as well. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, and then the next thing that we do is we really talk to students. You've got your S number now, so you can do some of the entrance exams for the college. Um, they can use AccuPlacer during the pandemic because we've had to do some stuff online. They've be able, been able to use EdReady. Uh, we really talk to students about just like for the SAT or PSAT or something, when you're going in to take one of these assessments, take a little bit of time and do some prep work. Um, so go in and take some practice tests or do, there's lots of resources um, at Pikes Peak Community College that they can go in online and get some assistance um, helping to prepare for those tests. And so we do ask them to do that because they do have to complete um, some type of assessment before they enter concurrent enrollment. And our um, college will also go ahead and work with the high school counselors to get them certified to proctor those exams at the high school on behalf of Pikes Peak Community College. They go through all the exam process and the training, and that makes it a little bit easier for these students to access AccuPlacer in non-pandemic times. <laughs> awesome. The next thing that we do is we ask our students to submit um, a, an online application. That's new for us this year. We have taken all the documents in D49 that we use for concurrent enrollment, and we've created those as uh, digital forms through Formstack. Um, what that also allows us to do is um, there's e-signing for all the documents, which during, particularly during COVID has been a huge plus for us. Um, but we do ask them to submit an application and they have to do it by the due date. That's kind of the first training that we do is make sure you get things in on time. And um, we do it as early as February or March for the coming fall semester. The reason that we have that date so early, um, we have to build master schedule for those students. We have to know which classes we're offering on our campus, how many students are gonna be in those classes. We have to build rosters. Um, we have to get them flagged both on the high school level and um, on the Pikes Peak Community College side. Shonda, do you wanna talk a little bit more about why that's important for you? Yes, so just as she said, we need to flag them or code them on our side as well. And that does things like lift the under 17 holds. So students who are taking courses 
on the college campus can get in and get registered for those classes that they qualify for without a ton of assistance from our office or from their counselors. Once they've been approved, then they're able to go ahead and take care of that and get it, get it all set up. Um, and then the coding in, itself allows us to work on things with D49 and Cheryl specifically. Uh, we kind of send some lists back and forth. We do some reconciliations and some rosters just to make sure that um, the students are getting into the classes they need to be in and that there are no surprises once we get to the billing authorization point. Then once the application is complete, um, the counselors and the advisors review the applications. They look at the test scores. They look at readiness forms, um, which I'll show you one of the readiness forms that we use, particularly for our ninth and 10th graders. Um, we have a lot of ninth and 10th graders that academically may be ready for college, but um, on the social emotional side, maybe they're not. Um, so we have some readiness forms that go out to teachers and we'll share those with you a little bit later. Um, and then once they've kind of vetted and approved the application, then the counselor or advisor sets up meetings with the students and parents. Um, and that's also been interesting during um, COVID world. Um, here are some of the, this is a copy of the application. This is before we digitized it just because it shows better if it's not digitized. So the first two, two sheets are just, it's a very simple application that students fill out. Just kind of tell us what your interests are, why you think you're interested in concurrent enrollment, and then getting all of that pertinent information that we need, like your S number and you know your name and birth date and say it and all the things that we need to be able to share with the college. Um, then if you look to the far right, um, it's a college readiness form. And that's the form that our ninth and 10th graders take to their high school teachers to look at and to be able to um, determine really, am I, am I ready to step into the college world? Um, the one thing that I always tell students is we never say, no, you can't do current enrollment. What we do sometimes say is, yes, but not now. Um, here are some things that you need to work on. And that becomes a really important part of that advising. Um, step five is the in the advising meeting, and this is busy. There's lots of stuff. Um, but for us, like I said, most of this has been turned over to um, being online, which has made it easier. They can be in a Zoom meeting and they can click on the link and share their screen and the advisor can walk them through exactly how to fill out those forms. Um, so the first thing the advisor does is really sits down and let's talk a little bit about your pathway, make sure that we really understand that. Um, we're going to review your application and make sure that we've got all the information that we need and it's all correct and ready to go. Um, then we review the expectations that D49 has for college students and um, also a tuition repayment agreement. So they really know upfront, um, these are the expectations when you go to college, you know that if you don't get an A, B or a C that your parents are going, you or your parents are going to have to repay that tuition. Um, the other really, really important thing um, to do is to discuss accommodations and accessibility services. Um, and this is, this is crucial for students because they are so used to, I've had my IEP meeting, I know what my accommodations are, and particularly if I'm taking a class on, a college class on campus, um, they just assume that those accommodations are going to be provided in that college class. And that is not the case the only accommodations they're gonna get are going to be the ones that are approved by accessibility services. Shonda, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Of course. Is there anything I missed? No, no. So especially with accessibility services, something that uh, students often need to be uh, informed about and parents especially is that with the college process, we're not modifying assignments. We're not reducing how much they need to do. The accommodations are simply to help bring them up to the same level that everyone else might already be at. And so when in high school, they're often used to, you do less of the work, uh, you know, maybe five of the assi uh, problems or um, questions. And then in the other students are doing, you know, 10, 15 of those questions. So that is a modification. With accessibility services, they're more likely to have more time available to them to complete the assignment, but they'll do the same number of questions as any other student in the class. Um, so 
both on the concurrent enrollment side and on the college side as well, we just want people to understand that those who are receiving accommodations are not getting um, something more, pardon me, or getting less uh, work to do. All they're doing is getting some sort of service to bring them up to the same level that the other students are already at in that class. Uh, so D49 does a really amazing job with making sure with everything on this particular slide that students or parents are well informed um, and we have a whole lot less uh, surprises later in the semester where they just say, well, no one told me that. Uh, so this process really truly helps inform everyone as we go along. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, we also review the student payment agreement. And, and again, that's really, um, they're gonna sign on the bottom line when we complete the CEA later on in the process. Um, and we've combined that document um, in partnership with um, Pikes Peak Community College. Um, and Shonda, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that as well? Thank you. So yes, the student payment agreement on the college side is required for absolutely every student attending Pikes Peak Community College. Um, and what we've been able to do is find the language that's required in the payment agreement that both adults and underage students with their parents would be signing of a document on our side. And as we collaborated with D49 and they created their agreements, we were able to embed specific language that meets our requirements as well, along with a link that the uh, students and parents can go to and read the entire payment agreement uh, specifically. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, when they're filling out their concurrent enrollment agreement with D49, they're filling out the payment agreement for um, PPCC at the exact same time. It's less paperwork, less signatures, less back and forth for the students and the parents, and it meets both of our needs. And that's one of the ways that we've been able to partner and be more efficient with D49. Thank you, Shonda. And I think that's been important for our families. Um, you know, less paperwork. And like I said, now we've been able to digitize it all. And Pikes Peak Community College was gracious enough to, to accept those electronic signatures as well on the student payment agreement. So it has really streamlined our process. Um, you know, now you've really talked about with the student about their pathway. You've talked about all this, the legal stuff that you need to worry about and um, understanding what the expectations are of a college student. And now we really get down to talking about um, classes. And we offer several classes on our D49 campuses. And we talk about those classes ver versus the on college campus classes. And we've actually written in our board policy that the first priority for students is if the class is offered on our campus that they take it on our campus. Um, we really like that to be kind of that first experience for students because there just is a little bit more support. You're still with your high school, you're still with your counselor. If you're really struggling, um, you know, there's somebody to talk to, there's somebody to maybe chew on you a little bit when you're not doing exactly what you should be doing in your class and those kinds of things. Um, and then once they've really talked about that, um, they begin and complete that concurrent enrollment agreement. And that really includes um, those courses that they're going to take. And we've been very, very careful about making sure that those courses actually align, just like Shonda said earlier, that those classes align with their pathway. We don't want to waste their time, our money, their cough, any of those kinds of things. We want to make sure that we're really clear with them about those classes um, meeting the pathway um, requirements. And then don't forget about the funding model. I added that because sometimes we forget that, um, I'm gonna show you the funding model in a minute. So don't forget about the funding model. I'll come back to that because um, it's, it's worth talking about when you talk about funding for the school district. This is just an example of what Shonda and I were talking about with the um, expectations for those students. They go through, they sign all of this. It talks about, if you look at number 12, I know it's a little hard to read, it's small, um, but number 12 talks about accessibility services. We go over this with each and every parent and each and every student. Um, and we do that during the advising session and then we send them a link to the document so they can then again, read it on their own and sign it um, so that they're very clear about what the expectations are. Um, this is another huge piece that this was one of our learning curves for uh, District 49. 
um, we initially had just said, okay, we're gonna put every student in English 121 and if they qualify math 121. Um, what we really learned is it really depends on what pathway that student is going down. So why would I have them take, um, I'm gonna use a STEM student, for example. Um, they may wanna go to the college and take 121, 122, 166, but they also are typically those students that are juniors and they're already in pre-calculus. So rather than put them in 121 or 122 or do something like that, we tell them finish your pre-calc class, then take the AccuPlacer and you may jump into either 166 or jump right into 201. Because if you're an engineering student, the only math that's gonna to count towards your degree is calculus or math 201. And so we've really been thoughtful about making sure that we don't make students take a class that they don't need or to tell them, you know what, you're not ready for 121 so you can't take college um, math. Well, that's not true. If I'm a liberal arts major, I can take math 120. Shonda, do you wanna add anything to this? Thank you, yes. Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about doing no harm. So, you know, as she was saying, there was a focus at a time where everybody takes college algebra and everybody takes, you know, a certain list of items. Um, but as she was saying, if their degree path doesn't require it, or they're able to jump ahead of it based on AP scores or something along those lines, eating up their cough or um, putting them in classes that don't meet their needs doesn't help them uh, finish their degree program in a, in a decent amount of time. And the other piece is if they're taking classes, let's say um, they were getting into Math 121 because everybody takes Math 121, um, but that's not the focus that they needed. And that's not where their skill levels necessarily were pressing them towards and they should have been in a Math 120. You're ending up looking at students with poor grades, withdrawals, those kinds of things. And that can, um, really hinder them when it comes to after concurrent enrollment. Once they get into the college side of things and they are dealing with financial aid, we wanna make sure that students are making um, adequate progress towards their degree. That's something that financial aid is looking at, but also um, whether or not they've had too many withdrawals. Those kinds of things can do long-term harm to students who do rely on financial aid. So the fact that this particular district is taking such a focus and making sure that students are getting the right courses, the right degree path, and not taking extraneous courses that they don't need or they're unlikely to be successful in. That is where they're choosing the path of no harm and doing what's best for the students. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Cheryl, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're good. Um, and then this is the concurrent agreement form that we have. And if you look at the current enrollment agreement form, um, they will list their classes. We, we say how many credits we've approved. Again, all of this is electronic now. Um, and if, if you look at number 14, and I know that the, the print again is tiny because it's on the slide, but number 14 is that language that we got from Pikes Peak Community College about the student payment agreement. Um, and that's what parents will sign off on that eliminates that additional paperwork that they have to do at Pikes Peak Community College. And then this is the funding model that we often have to remind our counselors and advisors about. Um, you know, when we talk about seat time, you know, part time in a, in a high school setting really depends on um, how long those classes are and those kinds of things. Are they blocked? What kinds of things are we talking about? Um, but if we really look at the funding piece, a student could take one concurrent enrollment class, one or two high school classes and do an internship. And they're a full-time student as far as um, state funding goes. And so remembering that those college courses, um, you know, really count for towards that full-time status. And the other thing that we really had to count, we really had to counsel our counselors on is um, making sure that they get out of that mindset of we have eight classes, so these students will have eight classes. Well, if two of those classes are college classes, that's a lot for a high school student. So giving them permission to say, you know what, if they have three high school classes 
and two college classes, that's more than enough. They're full-time students, everything is taken care of. You will get the funding that you need. Don't say there's eight periods in, you know, we're on a block schedule, so there's eight periods in an every two day schedule. They have to take all eight classes. Um, we were killing students doing that. And so having that conversation with our counselors to say, whoa, time out, let's not do that to them. Shonda, did you have anything to add here? I don't think so, but thank you. <laughs> And then really kind of step six is making sure that we follow up. We have some students that are taking classes off campus. Um, we have to make, we have to, we ask them to please send us um, a screenshot of your registration once you've registered for your, your classes at the college. We do that because we wanna make sure number one, they signed up for the classes that they agreed that we were, that we all agreed they were gonna sign up for. Um, number two, a lot of times students get confused and they sign up for a campus that doesn't work for them or they a class that's on a campus that doesn't work for them or they sign up for an online class and didn't know it was online. And so we do ask them to send us those so that we can just make sure that they've really registered where they should register. Um, and then this is where lots and lots of work happens between Shonda and I, where we really look at the rosters for those concurrent enrollment classes on our high school campus. And I should add at this point too, that I work through Shonda to get um, right now about 50% of our instructors for our on-campus classes um, are visiting instructors from Pikes Peak Community College. We can't grow them fast enough. Um, concurrent enrollment took off and went crazy. And so we end up having to have about half of our instructors um, come from Pikes Peak Community College. Shonda, do you wanna add anything there? Absolutely. So it's really great. And one of the pieces that's helpful here is that deadline that you have for those CE agreements and applications, because then you're aware of what classes you need. Sometimes you'll plan for only one of a certain course at a high school. And the next thing we know, you need three sections instead. Um, so this gives us ample time to find the instructors when they're needed, make sure that they are um, qualified and set up through the division at our college, um, get them all onboarded with paperwork. So all of that happens well in advance of the semester starting. Um, for example, you know, we have spring coming up. I've been working on visiting instructors, which is what we call that, um, since September. Uh, so it's just a slow process, but we want to get everyone placed where they need to be and make sure that it's a good fit for both the students and the instructor. Uh, so it's a really good uh, opportunity for us to work together. And then as she was talking about the rosters, um, Cheryl, we probably talk to each other 15 times a day <laughs> during those times. Uh, we're back and forth continually. Um, we know she'll send the rosters to me. We'll go through and check all of their holds, get them coded, check their um, prerequisites. And then I'll send back an error list to her um, for each and every school, each and every class, so that we can work through them systematically. Um, it takes us a little bit of time, but uh, we're typically able to get everyone um, fully registered um, as close to the start date as possible and no later than the drop date. So we work really closely and carefully together. And uh, I don't think that would work as well if we didn't have such a great relationship. No, I agree because our students find out early if they have a cough hold, they find out early if they have a, um, or if they're missing their cough, they find out early if they have a selective services hold. Um, they find out sometimes, you know, they've signed up for a class and maybe a counselor missed it or they just signed up for the wrong class, but they don't meet the prerequisites for that class. And we can work through all of those things early for students so that we can correct their schedule and get them doing what they need to be doing. Um, and then once they've really kind of started down the path and they're taking their classes, they're doing all of those kinds of things. Um, Pikes Peak has helped us out tremendously um, by setting up the Navigate Early Alerts. Um, and Shonda, if you can just share a little bit more about that. We're really excited to use the Navigate Early Alerts. Uh, we're 
still dipping our toe in the navigate system a little bit here and a little bit there, but the early alerts is something that we've really found extremely helpful. Uh, so we're able to go in and let's say they're offering a brand new type of class out at District 49, something they haven't offered before. If they want to monitor those specific students in that class a little more closely, we can flag them and um, navigate. It'll ask the instructors at periodic times throughout the semester to kind of give us basically a progress report. You know, are there any concerns? Are they showing up to class? Are they getting their work done? You know, whatever might be going on there. Um, and then those navigate early alerts come to me and I'm able to sift through them and find what I need to share and what I don't need to share. Um, and most of the time I'm not giving super specific information, um, but I am saying to Cheryl, hey, this student is not showing up to class. That might be something you wanna look into. And that gives the high school counselor a chance to sit down with them, dig in just a little bit and figure out what's going on. Are they having transportation issues? Is it um, you know, a technology access issue? Whatever else it might be, and that just gives them a chance to monitor those students a tad bit more closely. We don't necessarily do alerts on every student. Um, that would probably be a little too much, but it does give us a chance to um, uh, monitor those either um, with a specific situation or like I said, brand new classes. Well, and I'll use as an example, we had a student actually this semester who was, um, actually one of our career start students. He was going to the college for classes, wasn't turning anything in, having all kinds of problems. And you know, his counselor pulled him in and said, look, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, you know, what do we need to do to help you? You know, she helped him set up a schedule so that he was doing, he was going to class, he just wasn't doing his work. Um, and they kind of sat down and went through a schedule and talked about the things that would help him be successful, which is that added support that comes from it being a concurrent enrollment rather than I'm just gone off to college. Um, he is passing all of his classes now. And, and it just really was that little push that Navigate gave us to say, whoa, this, this is not typical of this student. Let's, let's check this out and find out what's going on. Uh, ladies, I um, and we do have about five minutes, five to 10 minutes left. And we got a bunch of questions to get to also. So um, I just want to let you know about that. Well, and I think these are just, this slide is just kind of the continuation, you know, talking to students as they're going through about certificates, um, about ascent, about scholarships that are available and about transfers. And a lot of that kind of falls into Shonda's wheelhouse because they're coming to her or they're leaving Pikes Peak to go to a four-year college. Yes, so I'll keep it brief since we do have that little time concern. <laughs> so with certificates, we just um, primarily we're supporting students with making sure that they're applying to graduate with their certificate or degree within the time allotment required by the college. So we're notifying counselors and students as well if they need to um, get that taken care of. And if they need any support, we're happy to help them with it as well. Once students become ascent students with District 49, the advising piece falls more to our office and they schedule advising appointments with me through Navigate typically uh, and then we'll sit down and look at their degree program, what they've completed so far and make sure that they're on track, that the courses they're taking qualify to be paid for under a sense and that they are meeting the requirements that the high school has as well. Um, and we offer scholarships at the college and we'll sit down and talk to any students, seniors or ascent students if needed, um, to let them know how to apply for those scholarships. A lot of them, they, uh, there's one general scholarship application and it will then go through and decide which of the different applications and different scholarships they would qualify to apply for and it applies for them. So helping them complete a really thorough general scholarship application on our website helps our students get more scholarships at the college. Um, and there are some that are specific to concurrent enrollment or another program we have with Career Start, which is still concurrent enrollment. Um, those scholarships are meant specifically for those students. They qualify because they were in those programs. So we, uh, not, I don't wanna say push them towards them, but we uh, advise them that they're available and we wanna help them get that done. 
Uh, and finally, about transfers, when we are doing advising at the college with students, we're looking with them at what university are you looking to transfer, if that's applicable to them? What program are you trying to get into over there? And how can we make the classes you take for your associates at Pikes Peak feed more cleanly into what you're trying to move into at the university? So we're looking at, <clears throat> pardon me, transfer uh, guides from each of the universities. We just really try to individualize these um, advising appointments and make sure that the students are getting the most um, detailed and accurate information for their specific situation. Uh, I think I wrapped that up pretty fast. <laughs> you did awesome. <laughs> and these are just, these are possible documents and links that we include in our toolkit. And what we've done is I've put all of these documents um, in a folder that actually Tammy has access to. And so if any of you, I know this is recorded, so you can go back and look at these forms. If there's any of these forms that you would like to use, we're happy to share. Some we created, some we begged, borrowed, and stole. Um, and so we're happy to share them. And Tammy has graciously offered to be the point person for that. Um, so this is our contact information. And, um, then for questions, I'll st um, I, I actually I'll stay on share. Shonda, do you want to look at the chat and see if there are some questions that um, we can answer? Cheryl, I just with I sent them to both you and Shonda. I've been kind of collecting them and I put a bunch together. Um, oh, okay. First one is how do you manage the digital divide? And I did just want to say that they're going to be creating a YouTube channel, uh, Marty, on our committee for these videos. Um, but as far as like actual physical documents. Cheryl's going to send them to me, so shoot me an email if you want something like that. I'd be happy to share, and we'll send them out to the Google group, and um, for concurrent enrollment um, personnel at the colleges, we have the work group. I'll send those out as well. But first question is, how do you manage the digital divide? And now they're, they should be in from me, the rest of the questions. That time. Okay, and I would say to that one, the digital, digital divide, um, we made sure that we, when we used Formstack, that it was compatible with cell phones, because although not all kids have um, other technology, most of them have cell phones. We also have a program in our district where every kid um, that needs a device, uh, particularly during the pandemic times, we've made sure that they have a device um, and that they have a place where they can go. Um, because we're also doing live remote learning, which means we're teaching a class on one campus and they can virtually attend from anywhere in the district. Cheryl, would you say that if they didn't have a device that there is somewhere on their school campus where they could sit down and do these applications if they needed to? Absolutely, absolutely. We have computer labs, we have all kinds of things that they can do. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. I'm kind of going through the questions here. Um, Tammy had answered the question about um, uh, the forms. And then I see uh, Lewis Palmer said, you know, they created YouTube videos. That was the other thing that I didn't mention that I should. It's really helped us with our advising. Ninth graders or 10th graders, those that are new to concurrent enrollment, all get the same information. So we've done kind of the same thing. We've created videos. So instead of having an hour long meeting with each of those families, we bring small groups together. Um, we share that information with them. And then that first initial meeting might be 15 minutes instead of an hour. Um, so we've utilized that too, and it really does help. Um, so Shonda, there's a question for you about removing underage holds and how long does the hold stay off? So once we have a student who is sponsored by a high school, we end the hold at that point. Um, but at any point, if the school lets us know that they're no longer going to sponsor them or that they've left the school, they've gone somewhere else, we'll go back and put that hold back in place. Um, but for the time being, our registrar is letting us go ahead and work it that way. So once they're sponsored, we are um, ending the hold until further notice. Okay, and then Shonda, this next one I think is for you too, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> do you find participating colleges require all documentation or does the IEP carry over? And does the data go into a database? So um, when students make appointments with accessibility services, um, it's often helpful if they bring their IEP with them for their appointment, um, but they would also may ask for additional documentation, maybe doctors, um, 
diagnoses, uh, notes from the doctor. I, unfortunately, I'm not an accessibility services specialist, so I don't know quite as many details about what it is they require. Um, and as far as a database, I am sorry, I can't answer that either. Uh, that all of that type of information lives with accessibility services and no one in the college can access it besides them. The only thing that um, anyone would know about a student being on accessibility services is if they have accommodations, the instructor gets some paperwork. That is not something that is um, available to the college staff um, kind of worldwide there, so. Great, and Kristen, I see your question about, you know, do we, let students know that their AA or the AS degree, for instance, if they want to go into engineering, um, you know, all 60 credits may not help for their future engineering program. Absolutely. And that's why we look at all of the guaranteed transfers. We look at the degree plans that students are going into. And math is a great example of us saying, that's why I said, you know, maybe we tell them don't take 121 or, um, you know, if they've done all of their, um, uh, general ed classes, we make sure those all fit within the degree program at the four-year college. And then we really talk to them about, you know what, you may wanna take one of those engineering classes because you don't want all your gen ed done and you haven't started those ninth, those, um, I started to say ninth grade, those freshman <laughs> um, engineering courses that, you, that are required at the college. So that is definitely part of the, um, you know, that's definitely part of the conversation that we have with them. Let's see, how do you track eligibility for athletics and, and CE grades? In District 49, that is the student's responsibility. They must show up to the athletic director every two weeks with a um, printout of their grades. So they can go into D2L, pull their grades, and it's their responsibility. And um, the rule at most of the high schools is you don't turn in your paperwork every two weeks, you don't play. It's just like, you know, not having, um, not having a grade, so. Um, let's see, how do you get by the secondary teaching license? I'm, I'm not sure what that question means. The person that asked that, can you, can you clarify what you mean by that? Okay, maybe he's not there anymore. <laughs> um, let's see. Cheryl, I think I, I know it is in probably. Time. I think that- I'm sorry? I think the secondary license, the teaching license, I think that has to do with how do you have adjuncts or um, campus pathway people come in and teach in your high school and not have a teaching license? I'm guessing that's what that question was. Okay, because it is a college course, not a high school course. Um, so they are a college instructor. They meet the requirements of the college. Um, so they don't have to meet the requirements of a, a high school secondary license. Um, Let's see, uh, there are lots of other questions I know and I also know we're out of time. Um, you do have our contact information. Please, please feel free to reach out at any time um, for any questions that you might have. Like I said, um, Tammy's handling all the documents so you'll have access to those. Like I said, it's just an example. You may wanna do something very different in your district. Uh, these are just kind of the lessons we've learned as we've gone through. Um, and I just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Shonda and our incredible partners at Pikes Peak Community College because this is a journey we really have gone through hand in hand together from the very beginning. I echo that. Thanks, Cheryl. It is a pleasure working with you guys. <laughs> and if anyone sends emails to me uh, with questions, please just let me know that you attended this session so that I have some context to your question. That'll help me make sure I know, oh, that's what they're asking me. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you to everyone. And please, please enjoy the rest of your sessions and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And don't forget to fill out your feedback form. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Bye.